Do we have the resolve as a people, as a country, as a government, to finally put this issue behind us? I believe that we do. I believe that we do. President Obama lays out his ideas for immigration reform. I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, a look at his proposals and what immigration activists in San Diego are saying about them. It's time to get all your tax paperwork together. I'm Amitha Sharma. We'll talk with the IRS about what's new this year, and we'll tell you about an unexpected discovery made during diabetes research. And we'll have a look at the medical miracle keeping terminal heart patients alive as they wait for a transplant. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Irwin Jacobs and by... Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. President Obama says now is the time to fix the nation's immigration system. Today in Las Vegas, he outlined his proposals and called on Congress to avoid getting stuck in bipartisan gridlock. We can't allow immigration reform to get bogged down in an endless debate. We've been debating this a very long time. And if Congress is unable to move forward in a timely fashion, I will send up a bill based on my proposal and insist that they vote on it right away. The president's plan is similar to one proposed yesterday by a bipartisan group of senators. The first point, to stay focused on enforcement, both through border security and making sure companies only hire legal workers. The second part is to deal with the 11 million undocumented already in the U.S. Obama says he wants to create a pathway to citizenship with background checks, payment of taxes and penalties, and a requirement to learn English. He says immigrants on this new pathway would have to get in line behind those who came to the U.S. legally. And the third part of the Obama plan is to bring legal immigration into the 21st century, eliminating long waits for families to be reunited, and to create a way to keep students and entrepreneurs in the U.S. once their visas expire so they can start businesses here. We're giving them all the skills they need to figure that out. But then we're going to turn around and tell them to start that business and create those jobs in China or India or Mexico or someplace else. That's not how you grow new industries in America. Supporters of immigration reform gathered at several locations in San Diego to watch President Obama's speech. Jill Replogo from our front terrace desk was at one of the viewing parties. So, Jill, who was there and how did the crowd respond? The viewing party was hosted by the newly formed San Diego Table on Immigration Policy. And it's important to note that, at least locally, pro-reformers have been the most vocal so far. So these are all people who really support immigration reform. At the event I went to, there were leaders of local immigrant rights groups, uh, labor unions, and some immigrants who are members of the community. And I think people were generally pleased with what the president had to say. Probably not very surprised. Um, he sort of outlined this before. A few people were kind of, you know, tired of the talk. Uh, they say they've heard it before. They're, they're pretty fired up to make sure this time Congress actually takes action, um, so they hope. And definitely some people were concerned about the enforcement component of proposed immigration reform. Uh, here's Pedro Rios. He's chairman of the San Diego Immigrant Rights Consortium. Uh, from my point of view, it'll be really difficult to support a bill that has those components, given that there's been a lot of um, enforcement already, a lot of families separated, uh, without much uh, accountability uh, resulting from that enforcement. And what does he mean by accountability? Rio said he'd like to see a reform bill that includes oversight of immigration enforcement officers and guaranteed respect for labor laws. And he said it would be hard for him to support a bill that includes more enforcement without these kinds of uh, checks, if you will. Front Terrace reporter Jill Replogel. Possible defense cuts are a big topic at the San Diego Convention Center this week. It's hosting West's 2013, the largest gathering of defense officials and contractors held each year on the West Coast. 
Nearly 10,000 people are attending. One of them, Corey Shockey, studies military policy and national defense issues at Stanford. She says the military is dealing with a long-term drawdown. Everything that looks non-essential or everything that looks like it can be delayed will be declared non-essential and will be delayed. And so business is making the case that what we do actually is central to what the department needs to successfully do, I think is the best approach to it. Shockey says companies that can be flexible and market products outside the defense industry will have the best shot at survival. San Diego home prices are continuing their upward climb. Standard & Poor's shows a one-month gain of nearly a full percentage point in San Diego. The Case-Shiller Index shows an eight-point increase from November 2011 to November 2012. Rising sales and a tighter supply are driving prices up. Gas prices are starting to creep up as well, though it's nothing like what we saw last October. The current average for a gallon of regular is $3.74. It's the highest price since November 30th. The Auto Club says it's a matter of low supply. Refineries are heading into their maintenance cycles, so the cost of wholesale gas went up last week by 50 cents a gallon. California doctors are asking a federal appeals court to review a decision allowing the state to cut their Medi-Cal payment rate by 10 percent. They say they're being asked to take the cut as health care reform uh, kicks in. It will add as many as 3 million people to the Medi-Cal rolls next year. The cut will save the state about $430 million a year. Doctors say the rate was proposed when the state's finances were in poor shape, and they say it makes no sense to leave it in place when California's in better financial health. Early bird taxpayers have usually filed their taxes by now, but last-minute changes in Washington held up the process this year. Amitha Sharma has information about the delayed start of tax season and what changes will take effect this year. Most taxpayers can start filing their returns tomorrow, more than a week later than originally planned. Rafael Tulino, spokesman from the local Internal Revenue Service, is here to talk about this year's filing changes. The IRS had planned to open tax filing on January 22nd. Right. Why was there a delay? Mainly because of the legislation that came along. It was enacted on January 2nd. So we can only administer the law as written. And so we had a lot of folks ready to take care of things as we did. But we need the extra time, the extra eight days, in this case from January 22nd, which was announced last year, uh, to get our processing and programming systems up to place. You know, we're administering and processing tens of millions of individual income tax returns and business returns as well. So that's the main reason why we asked for the extra time to make sure we have that up and ready to go. So who can exactly start filing tomorrow? The vast majority of taxpayers can. There are some folks and there's about two dozen forms. That information and all those forms are on IRS.gov. But those folks who have to file one of these forms, for example, one of the forms is a general business credit form, residential energy credits, that form, and a few, a bunch of others. Uh, we ask that you wait until we announce when that's going to be, probably in about three, four weeks, uh, maybe just a little bit later, depending on how we get going. But it has to be that way, unfortunately, because we want to get our programming and processing up to speed to do so. And it really has to do with the legislation that came along late and for us to administer what we have as the law comes. So apologize for that, of course. Uh, certainly we're trying to administer as best we can with the least burden to the taxpayer. So the people who actually have to, have to wait until the end of next month, possibly, mm -hmm. are the people who are filing for energy credits. What kind of energy credits? Uh, basically, for things around the house, for example, if you go, uh, if you want to put a, a, a washing machine or energy saving kind of appliance, that kind of thing that was brought back in the law, uh, certainly that form is 5695, and that information is on the IRS website so as to who uses it and how it works for you as a taxpayer. But if you're in that position, certainly check to be sure if you're going to take that credit or those credits that uh, you wait until that time. And we will announce it ASAP, but certainly we're asking for a little time here to get our systems up to place. And like I say, I apologize for that, but certainly uh, we'll get that going as soon as we can. So Congress made sweeping changes to the American Taxpayer Relief Act. As I understand it, some of those changes actually apply to 2012 yes. returns. Highlight some of those changes. Okay, AMT was brought back and made permanent. 2012. That's the alternative, AMT? yeah, the alternative minimum tax. So that was brought in for 2012. It was retroactive all the way back to the beginning of 2012. Estate tax was made permanent, and that information was brought back 2012. There are extenders that were brought back, the sales tax deduction, the tuition and fees deduction, the uh, teacher deduction for those teachers who spend full-time educators, money out of your own pocket. That was brought back when this law was enacted uh, earlier this month. 
for 2012. So hence some of the delay reasons for delays we had because we didn't know what we had to put on a tax form or what software was going to be able to put on your tax form when you file electronically in order to administer that as such. So that's part of the reason why we had that delay because we're addressing 2013, which we'll file next year, and also 2012 which we're filing for as we speak now. So the tax credit or the tax rate was raised on households bringing in $450,000 right. a year or more. Right. Um, what about households bringing in about up to $50,000 a year? What sorts of credits are available for them? Oh boy, there's a lot. And the first one that comes to mind is the earned income tax credit. So if you're making $50,000 or less and you have earned income, check to see if you qualify for EITC. This is a lucrative tax credit for a lot of folks, it's up to $5,800, although that really is for families with three or more. Somewhere in the fourteen dollars to $20,000 income tax bracket gets you a refundable credit, meaning even if you owe no tax or pay no tax, you can really get a big refund boost. So EITC is critical, it's important. Last year in San Diego County, more than half a billion uh, EITC funds were claimed, but we estimate about 20% of all taxpayers who are eligible don't claim it. So that one in particular is really important because there's so much money left on the table and we'd like to encourage you if you qualify for such to definitely take advantage of it because it can really significantly boost your refund as well as uh, finding the free tax preparation that you're going to find out in the community which we have every year which will help you get that credit because they'll prepare that return for free and see if you qualify for it. And how easy is that free help available to it's, There's dozens of sites throughout the whole county, lots of partners who partner with IRS. If you want information on such, irs.com. Gov. 211 is a good spot to find a site. They're open pretty much from this week all the way through mid-April. Very quickly, talk to me about tax-related identity theft. These are when criminals steal right. social security numbers yeah, we and really, use them to collect tax We returns. understand we have, we have detection, we have fraud, you know, protection, prevention in place. We really feel for you if you're in that position. Do contact the IRS, work with the IRS, and, and, and take a look at what's on the IRS website for everything, including that, as to what you can do if you happen to be uh, in that position. Rafael Tolino, good information to have. Thank, Thank you. you. Sure. For people under 65 with end-stage heart disease, a heart transplant can mean the difference between life and death, but there aren't nearly enough donated hearts to go around, so thousands of Americans are on a waiting list, including 30 people in San Diego. KPBS health reporter Kenny Goldberg tells us the newest generation of implantable heart pumps is keeping some of these patients alive while they wait. Paul Conway works hard to stay in shape. He takes brisk walks around his Chula Vista neighborhood with his wife, Grace, and he pumps iron at least three times a week. Okay, so he doesn't look like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but back in his prime, Conway was a competitive bodybuilder. Right now, I know I'll never look like I did when I was 22 years old um, when I won the Board of State. That's a long time ago. I'm glad I did it. I'm glad I won it. But now all I can do is be the best 53-year-old I can be. You wouldn't know it by looking at him, but Conway has end-stage heart disease. So what's keeping him alive? A heart pump called a left ventricular assist device, or LVAD for short. The device is implanted in Conway's chest. It's powered by special batteries that Conway keeps in a fanny pack. When Conway goes to sleep at night, he plugs the device into the wall. Conway says after he first complained of shortness of breath in 2005, Doctors discovered he had a blocked artery, so they put in a stent. His heart problems continued, and Conway had to have more stents put in. But in 2008, um, one of those 10 stents had two clots, two blood clots go into it. They blocked um, the major artery, I believe, I forget the technical name, but they call it the Widowmaker, I think it is. And uh, it had a heart attack, my body, and it destroyed probably over 50% of my heart. After that, Conway grew weaker and weaker. He couldn't even walk up the stairs. He couldn't leave the house. He couldn't go out and get our mail. He was short of breath all the time, and we couldn't do hardly anything. And it was scary. It was very scary. And the kids had asked me at one point, are we still going to have a dad? And that was a hard thing to answer. Conway was put on the waiting list for a heart transplant in 2010. As a stopgap measure, surgeons put in an LVAD. It wasn't that long ago that people who had a severely diseased heart either had to get a transplant or they die. But these days, 
People can live for years with a heart pump. This tube goes inside the heart, and then this tube goes into the uh, aorta, the big blood vessel coming out of the heart on the other side, and it pumps blood through it. Sharp cardiac surgeon Walter Dembitsky has put LVADs into dozens of patients with end-stage heart disease. He's trained surgeons all over the world in the use of the pumps. The devices were originally designed to serve as a bridge to transplant, but Dembitsky has had patients who've lived for years with an LVAD, including one man who's had the pump for more than a decade. It is a proven fact that this is good for you if you have terminal heart failure. It's good for your survival, it's good for your quality of life, it's good technology. But LVADs aren't perfect. They increase the risk of stroke, and they're not appropriate for every patient with advanced heart disease. Still, they become a viable option since donated hearts are in such short supply. The nonprofit group Life Sharing oversees organ donations in San Diego and Imperial counties. Executive Director Lisa Stocks says it takes a very special set of circumstances for someone to become a heart donor. A person has to die in a hospital with a brain injury while their heart is still beating. Um, they have to be of a certain age where the heart is still viable. Um, and their family has to consent for donation or they have to be on the registry to donate. Nationwide each year, there are only around 2,100 donated hearts. Currently, there are 30 San Diegans waiting for one, including Paul Conway. He's been on the list for more than two years. He has to stay within two hours driving distance of Sharp Hospital at all times in case a heart becomes available. In the meantime, Conway's learned to live with his LVAD, and so have his daughters. Well, um, it's kind of sad, but it's mostly fun because he can still do most things. Like, he still takes us places, like, and he still goes to Disneyland with us, and he can go on the roller coasters, some of them, still. I guess it's just cool, because he's like, all oh, robot. Conway says he's hanging tough until he gets his heart transplant. And I mean, I know it's here, and I know it can be aggravating, but every time I look at it, if I do get aggravated at it, I say it saved my life. It gave me th three more Christmases, three more New Year's, three more Halloweens with my daughters and my wife, so how can you complain about that? Kenny Goldberg, KPBS News. In the world of science, one discovery very often leads to another, if there's enough funding, that is. Now, scientists at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies are closing in on a possible new treatment for lung cancer. Amitha Sharma explains. In an age when federal money for scientific research is dwindling, the Salk Institute for Biological Studies recently struck gold with a $42 million grant. Already, the Helmsley Center for Genomic Medicine at Salk is getting promising results for a new cancer drug, which really isn't so new at all. Ruben Shaw, associate professor at Salk, joins me to talk about the research. Professor Shaw, you made a link, a discovery nearly a decade ago between lung cancer and a common diabetes drug known as Ben Foreman. What was the link? So the link was in, in trying to understand what this uh, lung cancer gene was doing, we discovered that the major function it has in the cell normally is to actually regulate cellular metabolism. And it acts as a kind of fuel gauge to tell the cell how much energy it has. In tumors that actually acquire alterations in this gene, then they lack the ability to know how much energy they have. Tumors normally have plenty of energy and plenty of blood supply, they're fine, but it suggested a potential therapeutic Achilles heel, if you will, for tumors that have this particular genetic alteration. So then searching for what types of things might lower the metabolism of cells, it turns out that they're not cancer drugs, existing cancer drugs, but actually the world of diabetes research. So the most commonly used diabetes drug is a drug called metformin. So we started exploring metformin in analogs of metformin that are more potent to see whether or not they might have the ability to selectively uh, kill off the tumor cells that lacked this gene. And indeed, that was the basis for this study. Okay, so you and a team of other scientists did yes. this study, and we have uh, some graphics of the results. Can you talk to me about those? Yes, yeah, so on, on the left-hand side, what we see, uh, we treated a series of uh, genetically engineered uh, models of lung cancer that carry alterations in different cancer genes. And on the left-hand side, we see tumors treated with placebo uh, as compared to, on the right-hand side, uh, lung tumors with this particular genetic alteration treated with fenformin. 
And what we observed was a shrinking uh, and a killing off of the tumor cells uh, that lack this particular gene when you treat with finformin. For lung cancers that have alterations in other genes, the finformin was not effective. I want to talk about that. So, I mean, as, as we all saw, the results are pretty dramatic. What emerges from this is what you call specialized treatment. Tell me about that. Yeah. Personalized. Uh, per this, this ties in with the idea of personalized medicine, uh, which is becoming more and more common in uh, cancer therapies today. And the idea is that you treat different patients based on the genetic alterations in their tumors. So the subtype of lung cancer then gets treated based on uh, which particular genes are altered. This has been done in other cancer types for about the past 10 years. So in breast cancer, you may have heard of something. Uh, people say, oh, my tumor I heard from the doctor is ER positive. ER is just a particular gene. If your tumor has that gene in, in high amounts of it, it means that you can use a therapy called tamoxifen to actually treat those breast cancers. If your breast cancer doesn't, is ER negative and doesn't have it, well then tamoxifen won't do anything for it. And how far away is the treatment? What stage in the process are you? Uh, great question. In this particular case, because metformin is the most widely used diabetes therapeutic, and this more potent version of it, finformin, has FDA approval and was used for diabetes for years, um, it can quickly be transitioned into the clinic. And so uh, me and my team are already uh, working with clinicians uh, on the East Coast and in uh, Montreal, actually, to translate these into phase one trials to see what doses might be effective and in combination with what other existing standard of care therapies. And what might be helpful in your further research is a $42 million grant that Salk recently received, I believe the largest in the Institute's history. That's What's correct. it going to be used for? What's the money going to be used for? So this money is going to be used to fuel uh, research into uh, what we call genomic medicine, which is really this underlying idea that all different diseases, not just cancer, but cancer, diabetes, Alzheimer's, have a genetic component. And that only in the past couple of years has the technology to sequence all of this the genes in a diseased tissue as compared to a normal tissue or in a patient that has the disease compared to a normal patient been possible to gain the full genetic sequence uh, and then tailor therapeutics based on that. So we believe just as this example with using a diabetes drug for cancer uh, illustrates that there are far more connections and basic processes that go wrong in these diseases which includes changes in metabolism, changes in inflammation and this grant will be used to create uh, genomic sequencing facilities and to create imaging facilities and other core infrastructure uh, as well as to actually help pay for uh, these advanced experiments with teams with the goal to expressly translate this into the clinic. Ruben Shah, thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you very much, Mita. I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour, President Obama's immigration reform plan, plus the budget battles facing the next Secretary of Defense. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Temperatures will start warming up in San Diego as January comes to a close, mid to upper 60s along the coast over the next few days, into the 70s for the inland valley areas with some clouds moving in by Friday. Sunny, mid 50s in the mountains and out in the desert look for temperatures in the mid 70s. Video games aren't just for kids and young adults anymore. Some San Diego seniors are using it to compete against each other three times a week in the St. Paul's Mannerite Bowling League. When you're up there and you're aiming, it's just like you're in the bowling alley. But this is far from your typical bowling alley. It's one of the first independent living facilities for seniors in San Diego. And three years ago, they started this. It feels like you're bowling as you would in the bowling alley. With a flick of the wrist, this wee bowling game is fairly easy to master even for those who can't see very well. My vision is limited and not as much as a member on my team who's more limited than I am. Pearl Donahue is one of the league's team captains and best bowlers with a score of 245. I think there are more people involved in this. Than we have five teams and there are four people on each team. Most of these bowlers are in their 80s and originally competed against other seniors online across the country. It costs $250 a, month, a year to join this league. And we decided 
why do we have to do this? We don't know these people. We'd have more fun bowling against one another. So they dropped out and created their own league, even changed the name to Welcome Men. Changed the name to the Mannerites because some men were interested and they thought the Paulettes sounded too feminine. <laughs> and just like a real bowling league, they post the scores daily and have an annual awards dinner to recognize the winners with certificates. And it's a lot easier than lifting a bowling ball. The last time the group tried that, at least two people were injured. St. Paul's Manor opened in 1960 and has been and has about 130 residents. Wee bowling is one of its most popular activities. Recapping tonight's top story, President Obama has outlined his plan for immigration reform, calling for tighter security at the borders, a crackdown on employers who hire undocumented workers, and a legal pathway for those who are already in the U.S. Immigration activists in San Diego say they've seen plenty of talk before, and this time they're hoping it leads to action. There will be more on the president's plan on the PBS NewsHour at 7. And you can find tonight's stories and download the KPBS app all on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. Have a great night.